Okay, so we've just read Matthew chapter number 30. Sorry, I haven't. Matthew chapter 20. There isn't a Matthew chapter 30. Matthew chapter 20. And in Matthew chapter 20, Jesus describes at the start of it what the kingdom of heaven is like. So he says there, for the kingdom of heaven is like. That's what he starts. The kingdom of heaven is like unto a man that is an householder, which went out early in the morning to hire laborers into his vineyard. So he's saying, what is the kingdom of heaven like? What is this talking about? Well, when you hear the kingdom of heaven, think about, um, well, you can turn there if you want to, John chapter number 3. John chapter number 3, very famous chapter of the Bible. Jesus says in John chapter number 3, in verse number 3, um, Jesus answered, said unto him, this is Jesus talking to Nicodemus, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Look down in verse number 5. Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. So this is telling us for someone, someone has to be born again in order to see or to enter into the kingdom of God. Well, you might say, well, is the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God the same? So what we read in Matthew 20 was the kingdom of heaven. Here it was talking about the kingdom of God. They are actually the same. If you're back in Matthew chapter 20, look back in Matthew chapter number 19. Matthew chapter number 19 and verse number 23. Matthew chapter 19, because there are some people that will teach the kingdom of heaven is one thing and the kingdom of God is another thing. People do say that. Um, but if you look in Ma uh, Matthew 19, verse 23, Then said Jesus unto his disciples, Verily I say unto you that a rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. And again I say unto you, It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. So here he's using them interchangeably. He says, I'm telling you this. And he says, again, I'm telling you this. One time he uses the kingdom of heaven. The other time he uses the kingdom of God. Because he's the same. You can also compare Matthew chapter 19 verse 14 with Mark chapter number 10 and verse 14. So Matthew chapter 19, that chapter where we are, Matthew 19, 14 says, But Jesus said, Suffer little children and forbid them not to come unto me, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. Then in Mark chapter 10 and verse 14 he says, But when Jesus saw it, he was much displeased and said unto them, Suffer the little children to come unto me and forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of God. Once again, we see the kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God, they're used interchangeably. So if Jesus is talking about what the kingdom of heaven is like, that's talking about people who are already saved. Because remember, for someone to see the kingdom, to enter into the kingdom, they've got to be born again. If someone's born again, okay, they've entered into the kingdom. Now he's telling you what the kingdom of heaven is like. Okay, And that makes sense, because as we read Matthew chapter 20, didn't we read about laborers? We did. It was about laborers going out and working at the field, being hired to do different jobs. Okay, we were at laborers. Well, what does labor mean? Labor means work. Okay, if, la if you're laboring, you're working. That's what it is. And so, if this was talking about people laboring in order to enter into the kingdom of heaven, that would be teaching work salvation. And we know that's not what the Bible teaches. You know, Ephesians two verse eight and nine: For by grace you saved through faith, that not of yourselves; it's the gift of God, not of works lest any man should boast. Okay, So if people are in the kingdom of heaven, that means that they're saved. Well, what sort of work are they doing then? If they're saved, what sort of work are people doing? Have a look at um, Luke chapter number 8. Luke chapter number 8. This is another very famous parable. Luke chapter number 8. <coughs> Excuse me. Luke chapter 8 and verse number 1. Luke chapter number 8. Verse number... Oh, actually... Oh, look at verse number 4. Luke chapter 8, verse number 4 says, And when much people were gathered together, and were come to him out of every city, he spake a parable. A sower went out to sow his seed. And as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and it was trodden down, and the fowls of the air devoured it. And some fell upon a rock, and as soon as it was sprung up, it withered away because it lacked moisture. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up with it and choked it. And other fell on good ground, and sprang up and bare fruit and hundredfold. And when he had said these things, he cried, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Mm -hmm. And his disciples asked him, saying, What might this parable be? They say, Can you explain it to us? You've told this parable, but they're saying, What does it mean? And he said, Unto you it is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to others in parables that seeing they might not see, and hearing they might not understand. Now the parable is this, The seed is the word of God. It's the word of God. So what's the, what's the seed that's being sown? The word of God. This is what, what we find in the Bible. The word of God. That's the seed. Verse 12. Those by the wayside are they that hear, 
Then cometh the devil and taketh away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. So when we preach the gospel, when we go out and sow the word, that's what we do. We go and preach the gospel to people. Then what happens? The devil comes and takes away the word out of people's hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. Because if they believed, what would they be? They'd be saved. And so he wants to take that away so that they don't believe. Verse number 13. They on the rock are they which when they hear receive the word with joy. And these have no root which for a while believe and in time of temptation fall away. So this is people who they hear, they receive the word. You know the Bible says, but as many as received him, to them gave you power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on the same. So they receive the word. These are also people who believe, they, but it says they have no root. For a while they believe and in time of temptation fall away. That's about how people, sometimes you can have faith that's stronger, sometimes you can have faith that's weaker. Someone might come, they might, they might get saved, they might come to church, they might get baptised, they might be growing. But then they can sometimes fall away, they can go back to the world, they can stop going to church, they can stop reading their Bible. Now, if they got saved, no matter what they do, they're still saved. Okay? But they can still fall away in the sense, as we're going to see here, they're not going to accomplish anything for God. They're not going to do any work for God that God wants them to do. Okay? Um, then have a look at verse number 14. And that which fell among thorns are they which, when they have heard, go forth and are choked with cares and riches and pleasures of this life and bring no fruit to perfection. So here we have... The, the, it's gone among thorns, okay? So that's the seed's growing up, but it's like, think about in the garden if you've got weeds growing there, okay? It's, it's, sort of, it's like it's choking and it's not, it's, it's things aren't, the, plant, the proper plants aren't growing well because you've got all these weeds there. And it describes what it is. It says they're choked with the cares and riches and pleasures of this life. So they've got worries, things they're worried about. Maybe they've, they've got riches, maybe they're, they're concerned with making money. You know, maybe it's the pleasures of this life. Maybe it's just some, some hobby, some activity, some, some, some you know, interest that they have that they spend all their time on. And because of that, what does it say? They bring no fruit to perfection. So they're not fruitful. Okay, and thinking, you think of like a plant growing up and producing fruit. Um, these aren't fruitful. Why? Because they're choked by the, these other things that are, that are in, their, in their life. Verse number 15. <coughs> but that on the good ground, a day which in an honest and good heart, having heard the word, Keep it and bring forth fruit with patience. So here we see people that are bringing forth fruit. And there's a, you can look at other parallel passages of this parable in some of the other Gospels. And here it talks about, it says they bring forth some, some 30, some 60, some 100 fold. Okay, so some people are very fruitful. Okay, and when the Bible talks about bringing forth fruit, the Bible says um, the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life and he that winneth souls is wise. So when you're bringing forth fruit, that's talking about preaching the gospel, other people getting saved. Because that, that's what of being fruitful. Like, I mean, my wife and I, we have children, you know? And that's, that's in fact, they're actually called, I think it's called the, like the fruit of the womb. In fact, that's actually, the Bible says that. Yes, it says, you know, the fruit of the womb is his reward. So it's, it's good. God wants us to be fruitful. And, there it goes again. Be fruitful and multiply. Okay? Mm -hmm. But as a believer, you can be fruitful. How you can be fruitful is you can preach the gospel. Someone else can believe and they can be saved. Okay? Now, we know that they're born again by the Word of God. It's, 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 it's the Word of God, it's the Holy Ghost, it's, it's Jesus who, who gives birth to them. But there's a sense in which it's like we give birth to them. In fact, the Apostle Paul said exactly that. He says, I've begotten you through the Gospel. So when you preach, someone believes, you go out and talk to someone at Varsity, and you show them how to be saved, and they believe, you've borne fruit. That's what's being fruitful. So some people will be hundredfold. Some people 60, some people 30, some people not bring, bring much at all. Why? Because they're choked out. You know, there's other things. There's other things that are taking them away and preventing them uh, for, be, for being fruitful. So, the work that we've seen described in this parable here um, is preaching the gospel. You know, um, most Christians would be familiar with the term the Great Commission. You've all heard that before, the Great Commission. We see the Great Commission, pretty much if you go to, to the end of each gospel, you'll find Jesus giving instructions to his disciples. Like, this is the last word. This is what I, you know, I'm leaving now. This is what I want you to do. For example, Matthew chapter number 28 and verse number 18, Matthew 28, 18, it says, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and on earth. Verse 19, Go ye therefore and teach all nations baptizing in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you alway, even unto the end of the world. Amen. So what did he tell them to do? He told them to go. That's what the Great Commission is. It's go. He says, go and teach your nations, and then he says, baptizing them. 
Well, what do you think you must be teaching them if the very next thing is baptising them? You must be teaching them the gospel, teaching them how to be saved. Those who get saved then get baptised, okay? And the others that get baptised, and then says, look, then teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. That's what's involved when you come to church. You get taught the rest of the book. Like, we don't come here every Sunday, and I don't, well, this is how you get saved. This is how you get saved. This is, you know, now some churches, they do every Sunday, they preach the gospel, okay? And what that means is when you're busy doing that, then you're not teaching, because there's a big book, there's a lot of stuff in here. There's not just the gospel. Now, the gospel is the most important, because whether you go to heaven or hell, that's the most important. But once you're on your way to heaven, you don't need to continually hear the gospel, someone preaching it to you. It's good for you to preach it to other people, but you don't need to hear, to hear it over and over again when there's other things in the Bible that we can learn. Okay? And so that's what it says, teaching to observe all things. What I've commanded you? So that was the one in, in Matthew. Um, there's another one in Mark. We're probably familiar with Mark um, 16, 15. He says... And he said unto them, well, here's that word again, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Says at the end of Matthew, says at the end of Mark. Have a look at um, uh, Luke chapter number 24. Luke chapter number 24. Luke chapter 24 and verse number 46. And he said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. So this is what happened. Jesus died, was buried, rose again. And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem, and ye are witnesses of all these things. And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. So he's saying, look, you need to, you know, repentance, remission of sins is going to be preached among all nations starting here. But he says, don't go just yet because I'm going to send the, the, the promise of the Holy Ghost. And we see, in fact, we see that um, in the start of the book of Acts, Acts chapter number 1, Another description of the same thing. He says in Acts chapter 1 verse 8. But ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me. Both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria. And unto the uttermost part of the earth. So he's saying look. The Holy Ghost is going to come upon you. And you're going to be witnesses. You're going to tell people about me. That I died. Was buried. And that I rose again. Okay. And so it's the same thing in all of them. I mean you know to turn there. But he talks about in, um, in John chapter 21. He says as my father sent me, so send I you. you know, it's the same thing. Over and over we see it. And so um, Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. That was his purpose. He came to seek and save that, was, that which was lost. But now have a look in Matthew chapter number 4. Matthew chapter number 4 and verse 19. Matthew chapter 4 and verse 19. Matthew 4, 19. It's Jesus speaking. And he saith unto them, Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. I will make you fishers of men. So if we want to follow Jesus, then we need to be fishers of men. The work that Jesus has given us to do, labouring in his vineyard, is soul winning. You know, Proverbs 11.30 says, The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he that winneth souls is wise. God wants us to be soul winners. He has commanded us to preach the gospel. But there are things that can hinder us from being a soul winner. There are things that can get in the way of us obeying God in this area. And the title of the sermon tonight is The Enemies of Soul Winning. We're going to look at some things that can get in the way of the gospel going forth. Okay? Some things that will get in the way. Turn, if you would, to um, uh, 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians chapter number <coughs> First Thessalonians chapter number 2. While you do, I'll read from 1 Thessalonians 1. It says, We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith, and labour of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and our Father, knowing, brethren, beloved, your election of God, for our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power, and in the Holy Ghost, and in much assurance, as you know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. And you became followers of us and of the Lord. Remember, Jesus said, Follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. Having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost, so that ye were in samples to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia, for from you sounded out the word of the Lord. Not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith to God would have spread abroad so that we need not to speak anything. You're there in 1 Thessalonians chapter number 2. 1 Thessalonians chapter number 2. Have a look at verse number 1. He says, For yourselves, brethren, know that our entrance into unto you that it was not in vain. But even after that we had suffered before and were shamefully entreated, as you know at Philippi, we were bold in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God with much contention. He says, we were bold to speak to the gospel, even though contention sounds like there was fighting, there was, there was problems going on. 
For our exhortation was not of deceit, nor uncleanness, nor in guile, but as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God which trieth our hearts. He's saying, look, we're speaking this, and we're not trying to please men, we're trying to please God. He says, verse 5, For neither at any time used we flattering words, as you know, nor a cloak of covetousness. God is witness. Nor of men sought we glory, neither of you nor yet of others, when we might have been burdensome as the apostles of Christ. But we were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherisheth her children. So this is describing, when we're preaching the gospel, we're supposed to be very gentle, very meek. We're not, we're not trying to cause fights and arguments. We're trying to preach the gospel. That's what we're trying to do. Verse number 8. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have parted unto you, not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls, because you were dear unto us. For you remember, brethren, our labour. Isn't that what we're talking about? Labour. Working. Our labour and travail. For labouring night and day, because we would not be chargeable unto any of you, we preached unto you the gospel of God. Ye are witnesses, and God also, how holily and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believe. As you know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you, as a father doth his children, that you would walk worthy of God, who hath called you unto his kingdom and glory. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God which you heard of us, you received it not as the word of men, but as is in truth the word of God which effectually worketh also in you that believe. For ye, brethren, became followers of the churches of God, which in Judea are in Christ Jesus. For ye also have suffered like things of your own countrymen, even as we, they have of the Jews, who both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets, and have persecuted us, and they please not God, and are contrary to all men. Look at verse 16. Forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles, that they might be saved. So here are people forbidding them to speak to the Gentiles, that they might be saved. To fill up their sins all the way, for the wrath has come upon them to the uttermost. But we, brethren, being taken from you for a short time in presence, not in heart, endeavoured the more abundantly to see your face with great desire, verse 18, wherefore we would have come unto you, even I, Paul, once and again, but Satan hindered us. So we saw people were hindering them back in verse 16. Here we see even Satan is hindering in verse number 18. And so throughout this here, we can see there's a, there's a number of different things that, you know, People are hindering. Verse 18, Satan is getting in the way. He's preventing happening what, what God wants to happen. So you might say, how is it? How does Satan hinder the gospel? You know, what, Satan is an enemy of the gospel. There's no doubt about that. He is an enemy of the gospel. Why is he an enemy of the gospel? Well, obviously, Satan hates God. He's, he's, he's the adversary of all that's right. So if God has his plans and what he wants to happen, Satan's going to be trying to stop that. He's going to be trying to prevent that. It says in um, 1 Peter 5.8, it says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking who may, whom he may devour. Okay, And so what it's saying is that the devil, he's, like a, he, he's, he's the adversary. Your adversary, the devil, he's, whatever we're doing, whatever God's doing, he's trying to oppose it. But not only that, he also has servants that are adversaries. Like the devil's trying to oppose people, but he has people who are his servants. Turn to Acts chapter number 13. Acts chapter number 13. Acts chapter number 13 and verse number 5. Acts chapter 13 and verse number 5. <clears throat> Acts 13 5. And when they were at Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. And they had also John to their minister. <coughs> Excuse me. And when they had gone through the isle to Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew whose name was Bar-Jesus, which, which was with the deputy of the, of the country, Sergius Paulus, a prudent man who called for Barnabas and Saul and desired to hear the word of God. So someone's asking them to preach, you know, let me hear the word of God. But Elimus the sorcerer, for so is his name by interpretation, withstood them seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. So here we see they're going to preach to someone, and this other person, what's he doing? He's withstanding it. He's trying to stop it. Verse 9, Then Saul, who is also called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him and said, O full of all subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness, wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? 
And now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thee, and thou shalt be blind, not seeing the sun for a season. And immediately there fell on him a mist and a darkness, and he went about seeking some to lead him by the hand. Then the deputy, when he saw it was done, believed, being astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. Okay, and see, here we see what's happened. This guy, he's trying to resist it. He's trying to prevent these things happening. And, and, and Saul, who his name was changed to Paul, in fact, from that point onwards, he's called Paul. He says, look, no, you, 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 what do you call him? Full of all subtlety and mischief, that child of the devil. You see, Satan has people who are working for him. He has people who are working for him. And the thing is, we don't, it's not that you know that someone's working for Satan necessarily. They're not, you know, they're not in a red suit. They don't, you know, they don't have wee horns or a pitchfork or anything like that. They look just like, in fact, actually, have a look at um, 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Let's see what Satan's servants look like. 2 Corinthians chapter number 11 and verse number <coughs> verse number 3. 2 Corinthians chapter number 11 and verse number 3. 1 Corinthians chapter number 11 verse number 3. He says, But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, remember that other guy was subtle, wasn't he? Through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus... So some people can preach Jesus, but it's a different Jesus. It's not the same Jesus as in the Bible. You know, if you have some, have some Mormons come and knock on your door, they'll, they'll be preaching a different Jesus. They'll be preaching about a Jesus who is the brother of Lucifer. That's what they believe. They believe that Jesus and Lucifer are brothers. Okay? Maybe you have the Jehovah's Witnesses. They'll come and tell you about Jesus. They'll tell you about Jesus and he's really an angel. The Archangel Michael. Well, that's another Jesus. That's a different Jesus. He says, For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if you receive another spirit, which you have not received, or another gospel, which you have not accepted. You see, there's a difference, isn't there? There's a different gospel that they have. You talk to the Mormons, and what gospel will they talk about? Mormons will talk about repenting of your sins. Jehovah's Witnesses, they'll talk about its works. It's faith and its works. You've got to have faith and works, okay? Um, he says another gospel which you have not accepted you might well bear with them look down in verse number 13 verse number 13 it says for such are false apostles deceitful workers transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ so what they look like what? they look like an apostle of Christ verse 14 and no marvel for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light therefore it is no great thing if his ministers or his servants also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. So Satan's servants, his ministers, what do they look like? They look like ministers of righteousness. They look like a religious leader. Don't they? I mean, you, I mean if you talk to some, some of these religious leaders, it could be like a Catholic priest. It could be a, you know, someone, a, a, a minister in the, in the Seventh-day Adventist church. You know, somewhere else where they preach a false gospel. And they can be very nice. They can smile, they can dress up, they can be polite. They... And what, what are they? But they're disguised. Satan transforms himself to an angel of light. Therefore, it's no great thing of his ministers, his servants, be transformed as the ministers of righteousness. So they sound like they're the right thing, but they're actually not. Okay, so we need to be aware of that. We need to be aware of that. So how is it that Satan, how does Satan oppose the gospel? The way that he opposes the gospel, one way is by bringing in false beliefs. You see, because if someone believes a false gospel, then they don't believe the true gospel. Okay? And often if they believe a false gospel, if they've been taught a false gospel, it's like it prevents them. Have you ever, have you ever talked to someone who believes a false gospel? And they cling, like if you talk to a Jehovah's Witness, and they cling to it. And it's always, you know, it can be really hard to present the true gospel because they don't want to hear it. You know? They don't want to hear it. Okay? Um... Another great example of this, this idea of, of turning from your sins to be saved. The idea of turning from your sins to be saved, that is the gospel that you find that's, that's, that's believed throughout false religion. You know, whether it's Catholicism, they believe in turning from your sins to be saved. Mormons, the same thing. Islam, they believe the same thing. They believe of repenting of your sins, turning from your sins. Now understand, do I believe in turning from your sins? Absolutely, because the Bible teaches that, but not to be saved. I mean, do I believe in coming to church? Yes. But do I believe in coming to church in order to be saved? Come to church, you're saved. Don't come to church, you're not saved. There are people who believe that. There are people who believe that if you don't go to church, or I haven't been to church for years, oh, therefore you're not saved. You've fallen away from the Lord, you're not saved. There are people that teach and say exactly that. 
Okay? And it's, what it is, it's a gospel of work salvation. And that's a pretty ironic thing, really, because if you think about it, gospel means good news. That's what the word gospel means. It means good news. But work salvation is anything but good news. It's not good, it's not good news at all. You know, I mean, the fact is that our works can't save us. Our best works can't save us. Have a look at, um, have a look at Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 64. Isaiah chapter 64. One of those big major prophets you find just after, after the book of Psalms. <coughs> you've got Proverbs and a, a few smaller books, and then you've got Isaiah. Isaiah chapter number 64. Isaiah chapter 64 and verse number 6. Isaiah 64 verse 6. Isaiah 64 verse 6 says, But we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. And we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. So he says, look, all our righteousnesses, the best that we've got, our best works are like what? Filthy rags. That doesn't sound like it's something that's valuable, does it? I mean, is it, is, is it filthy rags, is that worth anything at all? It's not, I mean, even if it's a clean rag, you'd use it for something, but it's dirt, if it's a dirty rag, I mean, you need to wash it before you can even use it for anything at all, okay? Filthy rags, that's what it's described as. Have a look at um, Philippians chapter number 3. Philippians chapter number 3. Philippians chapter number 3 and verse number 9. Philippians chapter 3 and verse number 9, Paul says, And be found in him not having mine own righteousness. This is what Paul says. Not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law. In other words, not my own righteousness, which I get by keeping the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ. Even the righteousness of, which is of God by faith. Okay? So that's pretty clear. It's our righteousness, is, they're not good enough. Paul says, no, my righteousness is not. I need Jesus' righteousness. You might say, well, does that really matter? Does it really matter if someone's preaching the gospel? It's just, it's not quite the same. It's just, it's just a wee bit different. Faith and works. Surely that's not a big deal. Well, have a look and see what Paul said in Galatians chapter number 1. Galatians chapter number 1 and verse number 6. Galatians chapter 1 and verse number 6. Paul says, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. He says it's a different gospel. Verse 7. Which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. So it's the gospel of Christ. It sounds like the gospel of Christ, but it's been perverted. It's been twisted. He says, But though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. He says, If, an, if we did it, even an angel did it. Isn't it funny how Islam, an angel, supposedly, Angel Gabriel, came and told Muhammad. That's where he got his gospel from. What about um, Joseph Smith? You know, the Mormons. Where did their gospel come from? The angel Moroni come and told them a different gospel. A different gospel which says you've got to turn from your sins. Verse number 9. As we said before, so say now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that you have received, let him be accursed. I mean, he's emphasis. he says it again. He says, look, he says it twice. It's just showing how important it is. He says, for do I now persuade men or God? If, or do I yet seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. Okay? And so it's an important thing for Paul to say it over and over again. And it's an important thing. Now, sometimes you might find that people, they might not necessarily preach a full-on work salvation, but instead they might try and just maybe mix a little bit of works in there. They'll just try and, you know, just sneak it in a little bit. But what it does is it leads to confusion. It, it muddies the water, if you like. You know? And not only that, if someone is preaching a confusing message, then, you know, are they going to be sure about it? Or are they going to be unsure about it? If, if the message is confusing... It's not like you think about if you're uncertain of something. You know, if you're if you're not certain about something, then that's going to make you hesitant. You know, when someone's someone's they're, they're unsure, they're hesitant about something, they're much less likely to do it. So if the, if the message they're pre preaching is like, well, oh, it's kind of like this, oh, it's kind of like that, are they really going to be motivated to get out and preach that gospel? No. Whereas if you've got a clear message, hey, it's clear you can get out there and, because you know what you're saying because you know what the Bible's saying. You know, that's an important thing. And so, because if you've got this, this mixed message, you're just not going to want to get out there and do it. And that will hurt the preaching of the gospel. Now, sometimes saved believers, they can get mixed up in different doctrines. I mean, one I've, I've spoken about before, the, the idea of Calvinism, okay? Um, Calvinism, this Calvinism is, is, a, is a false doctrine that saved believers can get mixed up in, and it will sabotage their attempts to preach the gospel. 
And, and why would that be? Why would it be? Because if you believe that God has already predetermined who will be saved, why would you go soul winning? Because whether you go soul winning or not, it's going to make no difference. The number of people who get saved, well, it's predetermined. It's already been predetermined. There is no... So then what's the point of going out? There's not. And there was... What's it... I'm trying to think. There's a famous missionary. Was it William William Carey? Was it him who was going to go somewhere? To, was it China or something like that, or India or something like that? Mm-hmm. And, and India and, and the people said, look, you know, when God wants to convert the heathen, he'll do it himself. Well, he said, go and preach the gospel to every creature. God's already said, go, and these people, are like, oh no, God will do it. Well, God's not going to do it. Mm-hmm. I was out souling this afternoon, and I didn't see Jesus anywhere. I didn't see him knocking on any doors. He's not, in fact, he's not. Why? Because he told us to do it. He told us to preach the gospel. And if we leave it up to him, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen unless we do it. You know? I mean, not only that, but this whole thing, you know, how could you honestly, could you even honestly give the gospel, the, some of the gospel message and offer them salvation if deep down you thought the offer was only genuinely made to a select group of people? And a small group of people, really? Because it's few that are saved. So if you thought the offer was really only to these few people. In fact, I, I heard another example I was reading. Someone called it, I think they called it Calvin's Dogs. It described this thing about a man who had a hundred dogs. Okay, and this was, this was this, someone's story to explain Calvinism. He, this man had a hundred dogs. And he, what did he do to them? He took um, 96 of them and put them in a cage. So they couldn't get out. They were stuck there. And he took these other four of them and... Um, tied ropes around their necks, and then he called them. He called those four, but they didn't hear him because they couldn't understand the call. And so what he then did is he then pulled the ropes, and he forced them to come. So the invitation he gave them was a forced invitation. So he made them come. Against their will, he forced them to come. And that was sort of the description. That's what it used. And so this is this, this, is this idea that God only wants certain people to be saved. That he only, he only selects certain people. And yeah, I mean, didn't we sing it earlier on? I think we did. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 9, that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. The Bible teaches that Jesus died for everyone. You know, every time we're out soul winning, 1 John 2 2, he's the propitiation. That's a big word. It basically means like the covering of the pain. It says for our sins, not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. You know, um, have a look at 2 Peter. 2 Peter chapter number... Um, 2 Peter chapter number 2 2 Peter chapter number 2 and verse number 1 2 Peter chapter number 2 and verse number 1 it says but there were false prophets also among the people even as there shall be false teachers among you who privily shall bring in damnable heresies even denying the Lord that bought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction so this is saying that these false teachers and if we compare 2 Peter 2 and Jude these are clearly people who are unsaved. It says these are essential. It says having not the spirit. They're unsaved people, unfalse, unsaved false teachers. And it says they, they're denying the Lord that bought them. So that means the Lord bought them. He paid for salvation for these people. Well, how could it be? How could it be that he paid for salvation for those people? Well, have a look at First Timothy. First Timothy. First Timothy chapter number. First Timothy chapter number four. First Timothy chapter. 1 Timothy chapter number 4 and verse number uh, verse, I'll look at verse number 9 it says this is a faithful saying this is a word, faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation this is something you need to accept mm-hmm. verse 10 for therefore we both labour and suffer reproach no actually it's an interesting I didn't notice that until just now therefore because of what he's about to say this is why we labour this is why we work because of this. This is why we labour and suffer approach because we trust in the living God who is the saviour of all men, especially of those that believe. So Jesus is the saviour of all men, but it's especially those who believe. He's the saviour of everyone, but only those who believe are, are who's actually saved. Have a look back at 1 Timothy chapter number 2. 1 Timothy chapter number 2 and verse number 3 says, For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our saviour, who will have all men to be saved and to come into the knowledge of the truth. He wants all men to be saved. Verse 5. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for some. No. He gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in 
due time. Okay, so it's important we need to understand there are things that if we, if we go down this path, and, I, and I'm speaking through experience because I've been mixed up in it before. Okay, I've been mixed up in it, and when I was, it prevented me from preaching the gospel to people. It prevented me from preaching the gospel to people. Now, there's, there's other ways. Other ways that say, Satan can hinder us. Look back at um, Luke chapter number Luke chapter number eight. Luke chapter number eight, and verse number fourteen. Luke chapter number eight. Luke chapter number eight and verse number fourteen. Other ways that Satan can hinder us. Other ways that he can be an enemy of the gospel. Um, Luke chapter eight verse fourteen says. And they which fell, that which fell among thorns are they which, when they have heard, go forth and are choked. They're hindered. They're choked with cares and riches and pleasures of this life and bring no fruit to perfection. <coughs> Satan can hinder us. He can bring these things into our lives. These, you know, these cares, these pleasures, these things that are going to take us away from things of God. Now, it could be Satan, but it could also just be us. We could just be allowing ourselves to be distracted by these things. We could be allowing ourselves to be led away into something that's going to take us away from the work that God's given us. God's given us this work to do. And if we're not doing it, we have to ask ourselves, why aren't we doing it? What are we doing instead of it? Okay? Um, what, else, what else would um, Satan do? Satan wants to bring doubt into our lives and stop us from serving God. We're all familiar with what was the first thing that Satan said right back in Genesis chapter number 3? He said, Yea, hath God said. Did God really say that? He wants, he wants to bring doubt. Doubt is the, is the opposite of faith. If you, if you have doubt, then you don't have faith. And if you have faith, then you, know, then you don't doubt. Okay? And so th these things are two opposites. Well, where does faith come from? Where does faith come from? Have a look at Romans chapter number 10. Romans chapter 10 and verse number 17. Romans chapter 10 and verse number 17. It says, so then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. If you want to increase your faith, if you want to have more faith, then get into God's word. You know, in fact, fight back by hiding God's word in your heart. I remember the first time when I went out soul winning, and I've been soul winning for a number of days, and, and someone finally got saved. And I, and I came back from someone getting saved, and it's like all of a sudden there's all these, all these doubts. All these doubts coming in. Oh, was that genuine? What's going on here? What did I do to combat that? I went to God's word, and I started memorizing Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6, that was the one that I picked. And I memorized that whole chapter. And it just got rid of the doubts. This is what Paul said. That I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in bonds. That then I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. So say, look, this is what we need to do. Get out and speak. And speak boldly. Okay? Um, uh, the Bible says in Psalm 119 verse 11, Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. We need to hide God's word in our heart and it will prevent us from sinning against God. And one of the ways of sinning is not doing what we're supposed to do. The Bible says that him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Um, <coughs> other, um, other hindrances or enemies of soul winning. Actually, have you? Yeah, I've talked about Ephesians before. Have a look at Ephesians chapter number 6. Ephesians chapter number 6. Ephesians chapter number 6. Another enemy or a hindrance to soul winning is lack of preparation. Lack of preparation. Okay? Lack of preparation. Have a look at um, Ephesians chapter 6 and verse number 15. It says, And your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. So think about what that means. Your feet shod. That's saying putting shoes on your feet. Well, why? Because the Bible says, Jesus said, go. Well, if you're going to go, the natural thing would be you'd put some shoes on, wouldn't it? Okay, so what happens if you don't, let's say you don't have shoes on, and I'm going to go to someone, but I don't have any shoes on. You're not really prepared, you know. Maybe you might be a gravel road out there, well, around here, around the vast, lots of broken glass everywhere, etc., etc. You're not really prepared. That's going to, oh, I don't want to really go because my feet aren't ready. So what do you have to do? Put your shoes on. Prepare yourself. Well, it's a picture having your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. The preparation is being prepared to preach the gospel, knowing what to say, learning what to say, you know, so that you know when, how you can take people to the verses and show them what they need, what they need to believe in order to be saved. Okay? Now, sometimes it could, have, it could be that the reason why we're lacking preparation, it might be just because, well, we're too busy, haven't got around to prepare it. But sometimes it could be something else. It might be because we're afraid. I'm scared, so therefore I won't do the preparation, and then, oh, well, I can't go because I haven't done the preparation. 
well, no, you're better off just actually go out anyway. Come out as a silent partner. That's fine. Come out as a silent partner. Then you don't have to say anything at all. You don't put some shoes on so you don't you know, hurt your feet on the broken glass. But, you know, these are things we need to think and say, what is it that's holding me back? What is it that's hindering me from preaching the gospel? Turn to Matthew chapter number 9. Matthew chapter number 9. Matthew chapter number 9. This is another, this is quite an important hindrance to the gospel. Matthew chapter 9 and verse number 36. Verse number 36. It says, but when he saw the multitudes, this is Jesus, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Then saith he unto his disciples, the harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he would see, will send forth laborers into his harvest. So we're very familiar with those verses. We haven't got the poster finished fixed up yet, but we will have soon and get it chucked on the wall. But we often talk about that. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. That's what we want. We want laborers to go out into the harvest. There are, there are plenty of people there. But notice what it says in verse number 36. It says he was moved with compassion. So we need to have compassion for the lost. When we realize that people who are lost, when they die, they're going to go to hell. Think about that. Do we want people to go to hell? Or do we want people to be saved and go to heaven? And have compassion for the lost. And cause that compassion to put aside your fear and say, well, I'm going to do what I need to do to learn how I can preach the gospel to people. You know? And, and come along as a silent partner. I'll take you as a silent partner. You know, Maureen will take you as a silent partner. You know, other people will take us out and learn how to do it. It's an important thing we need to do. We need to have compassion. We need to have love for the lost. You know? Now, please don't understand, don't misunderstand me. Don't think that I'm saying that everything um, you know, that keeps us back from going soul winning. It's all the devil tempting us, or it's all our own sinfulness. You know, th th sometimes it is, but there are, I mean, there can be other reasons. Other things do come in. We do have things in our life that we have to do. That's just a fact. We have jobs we have to do. We have studies we have to do. I mean, we have, we have events happen in our lives. I mean, we get sick. You know, we get sick. I mean, over the last few weeks, there's been less soul winning. You know, I've done less soul winning. Why? Because there was sickness within my, myself and my family. And so it's natural these things, they will hinder you, okay? But I need to be really careful and not use an excuse. Not take my sickness and use it as an excuse for saying, well, I'm not going to do it because of that, okay? And, and, and personally, for me personally, I find that one of the things that I really need to fight against it really what it comes down to for me personally is laziness. Okay? It really comes down to laziness. I mean, when I first started preaching the gospel, when I first went out to preach the gospel, fear was a big thing. But I mean, once you do it a few times, you just get used to it. It's like, there was nothing really to be, afraid, to be afraid of. There's nothing to be scared of. Then it's just a case of, well, what would I rather do? You know, sit at home and put my feet up or go out and labour in the vineyard, do some work. And it's like, obviously, it's easier to sit at home with your feet up. Okay? And so that's, that's just laziness. It says in, um, in Proverbs chapter 18, verse number 9, Proverbs 18, verse 9, it says, He also that is slothful in his work is brother to him that is a great waster. Okay, and so when we're slothful, we're not doing the work we're supposed to be doing, that's like very similar, that's what it says, is a brother to him that is a great waster. And what, what would we be wasting? Wasting the opportunity that God has given us. I mean, didn't we read that before? The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Um, Proverbs chapter 10 verse 26 it says as vinegar to the teeth and as smoke to the eyes so is the slugger to them that send him now what did Jesus say as my father sent me so send I you so he has sent us he sent us to preach the gospel but if he sends us to preach the gospel and we don't do it it says it's like vinegar to the teeth which doesn't sound pleasant or a smoke to the eyes you ever been around a, you know, around a campfire and the wind changes and it keeps blowing your eyes it stings your eyes isn't it annoying isn't it? It's not pleasant, is it? It's not a pleasant thing. Well, well, guess what? When we don't do what God's asking us to do, that's not pleasant to God. God's not liking that. Um, Matthew chapter 25, verse 26, it says, His Lord answered, said unto him, and this was like to do with the parable of the, the talents or whatever, when he, when he gave them things to see what they used, he says, The Lord answered, said unto him, Thou wicked and slothful servant. Thou wicked and slothful servant. So it, 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 he associates someone who's, who's being lazy, who's being slothful, with wickedness. That's what, that's what he says. Thou wicked and slothful servant. So, 
Remember we started off, we started off back in Matthew chapter number 20, didn't we? In Matthew chapter number 20, we saw that even those who worked just for the last hour, didn't they get a reward? In fact, didn't they get just as much reward as people that were working all day? They did. So there's a great reward. God wants, he's got rewards to give us for our work. You know, I'm always going on about we're saved by faith and it's not works. But we need to also remember God's got works he wants us to do and he's going to reward us. It says in uh, Matthew chapter number 16, Matthew chapter 16 and verse number 27, it says, For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels and then he shall reward every man according to his works. We're going to be rewarded according to our works. That's what the Bible says. We're not saved by works, but we are rewarded according to our works. You know, um, have a look at 1 Corinthians chapter number 3. 1 Corinthians chapter number 3. 1 Corinthians chapter number 3 and verse number 6. 1 Corinthians chapter number 3 and verse number 6. 1 Corinthians 3 verse number 6. It says, I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. Okay, so he, one, Paul's planting, Apollos is watering, but God's giving the increase. So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one. So it means the same person who plants is the same person who waters. In other words, it's not that Paul only planted and Apollos only watered. Paul was out there planting and watering and planting and watering. So was Apollos. But sometimes you're planting. In other words, that's when it's someone for the first, they've never heard the word. Other times you meet someone who they've already heard the gospel before. And you're watering. You're watering. You're adding to what's gone on before. Um, verse number... Verse number 9, for we are labourers together with God. Ye are God's husband, and ye are God's building. building. We are labourers together with God. God's got a work that he wants us to do. He wants us to roll our sleeves up and get to work. Verse 10, according to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereupon. Let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. So our works are going to be revealed at the end of the world. They're going to be revealed to see what they were worth. They're going to re it says revealed by fire. Verse number 14, And if any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. So if the work you've been doing is something that lasts, you'll get a reward. It says, um, verse 15, If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so is by fire. So if the things that we've done have got lasting value, for example, when you preach the gospel and someone gets saved, that's something that lasts forever. Now you might do other things. You might you know, build a house. What's going to happen to that house eventually? It's going to be burned up. You might build a great business. What's going to happen to that? Is that going to last forever? Does it have eternal value? No, it's not. These aren't, these aren't wrong things. Like the wood, hay and stubble. These aren't sinful things. But the thing is we need to look and say, what has eternal value? What is the thing that lasts? Okay. And imagine if you had a life and all you did, you did nothing that had any eternal value whatsoever. Everything would be burned. There'd be nothing left at all. Doesn't mean you're not saved. Okay, but are you going to receive great rewards? No, because, well, you didn't really do much of the work that God gave you to do. And that's the thing, he went out to hire labourers into his vineyard. Have a look at 2 Corinthians chapter number 5. 2 Corinthians chapter number 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse number 18. It says, And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. He's given us the word of, for people to be reconciled. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. We are ambassadors. That means that we have been given the job of speaking on God's behalf to people. We're an ambassador for Christ. So when you speak to someone about Jesus, that's what you're doing. You're doing the work of an ambassador. And God's going to reward us for the works that we do. You see? And that's the thing we need to understand. God, he's got works that he wants us to do. And the primary job is preaching the gospel. 
Preaching the gospel is the primary job. It's the great commission. I mean, where Jesus left, when we look through it all, what did he say? At the end of Matthew, go. At the end of Mark, go. That's what he's saying. Go. That's the work to do. Now, there are plenty of other things we should have in our lives. Should we be praying? Obviously. There's many exhortations to do that. Should we be reading our Bible? Yes, absolutely, we should. You know? Um, should we be coming to church? Absolutely. Should we be raising our, our children you know, the way God wants us to? Yes. Should we be cleaning up our lives, getting the sin, saying, look, this is something I'm doing wrong, I need to stop doing that. Should we be doing those things? Yes. Those are all great, but that's not the job that we've been given. Okay, these are all extra things. Things that, they're, they're necessary, it's important we do that, but the main focus, I mean, think about, you know, does God want us to, to dress right, or does he want us to dress in a, in, a, in, a, in a highly inappropriate way. Does he, want us to, does he want us to look like, you know, a slob? Does he want us to be, you know, unclean? Does he want us to, does, or does he want us to be presented? You know, would it be good, would it be a good thing to knock on someone's door and open the door, it's like, it smells so bad. They don't want to listen to us. Would that be all right? No. But the thing to understand is, think about with your job, you know, think about going to work. Imagine if you turned up to work and you did everything. You were dressed up nice and clean and tidy, you'd showered, you'd, everything was fresh, but then you just didn't do anything. So you see there's lots of things we should do. You still have to you know, have a shave or whatever, or, or brush your hair if you've got hair, put on tidy clothes. You know, There's things you need to do, including getting out of bed and turning up at work, but at the end of the day you've still got the job, whatever your job is what you actually have to do. You see, there's all these other things, but there's actually the job that we've been asked to do. And this is what he says. We need, we, he's given us a job to do. You know, whatever it may be, whatever's holding you back from preaching gospel, find out what it is. It could be different things at different times, you know. Talk about before, illness. You know, for me it was, you know, laziness was a thing. When I first started out, it was fear. It could be false doctrine. You think, well, I'll go somewhere, but I'm not sure about this. Well, then get it nailed down. Sort it out. Find out what your biggest challenge is and work to overcome it. And this counts for everybody. This counts for everybody. I mean, just look at the time. Just quickly have a look at Acts chapter number 2. Acts chapter number 2. Acts chapter number 2. Yeah, I didn't write down the verse, but I'm sure we'll find it there somewhere. Um, Acts chapter number 2 and verse number 17. It says, It shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions, your old men shall dream dreams, and on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. Verse number 21, it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's for all of us. It's for man, it's for woman, it's for boy, it's for girl, it's for young, and it's for old. That's an important thing. It's for each one of us. Um, last scripture we'll look at is Philippians. Philippians chapter number 4. Philippians chapter number 4. <coughs> Philippians chapter number 4 Paul says therefore my brethren Philippians 4 verse 1 therefore my brethren dearly beloved and long for my joy and crown so stand fast Lord my dearly beloved I beseech you Odys, and beseech Syntyche that they be of the same mind in the Lord and I entreat the also true yoke fellow help those women which laboured with me in the gospel with Clement also with other my fellow labourers whose names are in the book of life he's saying look these these women, they laboured with me in the gospel. You say, well, I, but I can't do it. Well, have a look at Philippians 4 verse 13. Philippians 4 verse 13 says, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. God's given us a task to do. There are things that will going to try and stop you. Enemies of soul winning. You know, Satan wants to hinder you. You know, our own things in our life we can have that want to stop us from doing it. But we need to say, look, what does God want? What is it that's holding me back and what can I do to take a step? You know, and I'm not saying you need to go from, well, I've never been soloing once in my life and now I need to go out seven days a week and spend a couple of hours a day. No, just, just decide, I'm going to come out once a week. I'm going to, I'm going to, come, I'm going to be a silent partner. I'm going to just, just take a little step. I'm going to learn some of the verses. You know, so that when I talk to people, when I talk to people in my classes, you know, oh, you're a Christian. Oh, can you tell me about that? Yeah, I can show you. This is how you can know. This is how you can be saved. This is what the Bible says. Just taking one step, one step, one step. And there's rewards. There are great rewards. Jesus is probably, in fact, one last verse. Um, I said it was the last one before. Very last one. Uh, Revelation 22. Revelation 22. Revelation chapter number 22. <clears throat> 
and verses... Oh, 12. Revelation 20, verse 12. He says, And behold, I come quickly, this is Jesus, and my reward is with me, to give every man according as his work shall be. So Jesus is coming, and he's coming, and his reward is with him. He's got a reward to give every man according as his work shall be. Wouldn't it be a sad thing for Jesus to come to bring a reward for you? And I didn't do any work. I have to give it to someone else. I mean, doesn't he want to reward us? That's why he's bringing it. He's bringing it. He's my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. Okay? And it's not, some people say, oh, well, you shouldn't be motivated by rewards. Then why does over and over God talk about, I'll give you rewards? I'll give you rewards. Okay? He obviously, it sounds like good motivation from his perspective. We want to do what God, I mean, it would be great if we just did it. Hey, I have no, no thought for reward. That's fine. But still do the work. Still do the labour that God has called us to do. Let's pray. Gracious Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you've given us a task, Lord. You've given us, it's a, it's a privilege that we can work for you. Please help us to find whatever it is in our lives, what the enemies of soul we may be in our lives, and help us to defeat those enemies. Help us to stand up to Satan. Help us to find what areas we're tempted in and to change those areas. Help us to, 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 to follow you with our whole heart, with our whole soul, to give you everything, Lord, to put you first in our lives, to give you the preeminence. Lord, I thank you for each person here. I just pray you'd bless each one of us and pray we'd see many more souls saved this week. We ask these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen.